This being the Wednesday before Easter, um, we traditionally hear uh, focus on that week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, and then ultimately on Sunday we celebrate His resurrection. In as many years as I can remember past, um, on this Wednesday night prior to the celebration of His resurrection on Sunday, I typically focus solely on the Passover. The Passover as a feast, the Passover as a meal that Jesus shared with His disciples. This year I felt um, like expanding it a little bit. And so instead of it being referred to as Passover, we're referring to the whole week as Passion Week. And Passion Week is the traditional name for this week of Jesus' life between Palm Sunday and Easter. And it was so called and has been traditionally called Passion Week because Jesus passionately and willingly laid down his life for the sins of the world and then rose again from the dead three days later. And so rather than only looking at the Passover meal tonight, what I wanted to do was to look at three aspects of Passion Week. The first is going to be Palm Sunday. The second is going to be, again, about Passover and the meal that they shared together. And then the last part, the third part tonight, will be about His crucifixion, will be focusing on the cross. And in between each of these three points, uh, we're going to sing, and we're just going to remember how He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we're gonna, I'm going to teach a little bit about it, and then we're going to sing a song about that. And then we're going to talk about how He had this Passover meal with His disciples, and ultimately He is the Lamb who laid down His life for the sins of the world. We're going to sing about that. And then the last point, again, about the cross, we're going to sing, sing about our hope in Christ because of His death on the cross. And then, of course, Sunday is the celebration time. So, you know, Passion Week is a little somber, uh, and it should be, uh, in terms of us just really drinking this in and understanding the seriousness of what Christ has done for us, the price that He paid, the uh, suffering that He endured. And so, He comes to us with passion for the world, and thus we're going to focus on Passion Week. So, I hope you're your fingers are nimble because you're going to be turning through the Bible with me as we just do. I'm just going to kind of walk you through Scripture related to uh, these things concerning the Passion Week of Christ. And we'll be mainly here in Luke, and then we'll also jump to Exodus, and we'll come back to Matthew at the end. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we just commit now our Bible study to You, we just pray that as we make our way through Scripture tonight that You will remind us of just the incredible just gravity of this whole thing. That You came to earth, took on flesh to die for our sins. And we look forward to celebrating Your resurrection on Sunday, but for tonight, we focus on this final week of Your life. You endured so much. You you didn't retaliate. You were motivated by your love for us. And you endured such suffering and shame. And we pray that we would just try to grasp some of this, the magnitude of it all. Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to appreciate, to understand, and to love you in response to your first loving us. We thank you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Here in Luke chapter 19, I'm going to begin reading at verse 28. So this has to do with when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on what we traditionally call Palm Sunday. This begins the Passion Week. Luke 19, starting at verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead and going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass... When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that's the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you. Where you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? 
Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? Okay, pause for a moment. We have to kind of put this in modern terms because I find this story funny. Now that's because I find a lot of things funny that I probably shouldn't, but that's just me. The reason I find this funny is because Jesus tells a couple of his disciples, go ahead to the next village. You're going to find a colt there, a donkey, never been ridden on. It's tied up. I want you to just steal it. (laughs) That's what he's saying. And if anybody asks you, "What, what are you doing? You just say, well, the Lord has need of it. So let's put it in modern terms. A donkey was a beast of burden, and it was also a form of transportation. This would be like Jesus saying to you, go over to Ashburn, you're going to find a brand new Ford F-150 no one's ever ridden, and I want you to hotwire the thing. I want you to drive it to me. And if anybody asks, what are you doing? You just say, the Lord needs it. You got that? That's what's happening here. And they do, and look at the next verse. Verse 34, and they said, the Lord has need of it, because they're asked, what are you doing? The Lord has need of it. And then they brought him to Jesus. You know, the the owners didn't balk at it. And they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Now, this is where John's gospel adds, and they took palm branches, and they waved them, and they laid them down. So that's why it's traditionally called Palm Sunday, although only John's gospel mentions palms. Verse 37, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen saying, and now notice they're going to quote here from Psalm 118 verse 26, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So there's this wonderful you know, parade that is happening where Jesus is the only one in the parade, but he's riding on a donkey. People are lining the streets. They're waving palm branches. They're rejoicing. They're shouting. And they're quoting here from Psalm 118, 26, which is a messianic psalm. So they get it in the moment. Unfortunately, their fears and their distrust is going to take over. And as I said on Sunday, they're going to go from uh, cheering him to jeering him. But nevertheless, for the moment, they're quoting a messianic passage. Now, look, next verse, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why did the religious leaders want Jesus to rebuke his disciples? Because they were quoting a messianic passage. And the religious leaders did not believe that he was Messiah. And so they thought that this was an indignant thing to do. And so they wanted Jesus to rebuke his disciples, tell them to be quiet. But verse 40, he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And so picture Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Those of you who have been with me to uh, Israel, there, we take the Palm Sunday road. It's a very steep decline from the Mount of Olives. Uh, I mean, you know, people are holding onto railings. It's very steep going down this paved area, which now is paved. And Jesus is making his way down the Mount of Olives. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley into the old city of Jerusalem. And as he, verse 41, this is a very sad verse, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Now, in your Bible, circle or highlight the word wept. Only two times in the Bible that it mentions Jesus wept, specifically saying that he wept. Here, and another passage in John eleven thirty five, 35, which was at the time of Lazarus' death. Remember, he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. But when he wept at the tomb of Lazarus, the Greek word in the original language in John eleven thirty five 35 is dakruo. Dakruo means to shed a tear. Just a little slight shedding of a tear. But here, in this passage, it is a different word for weep. It is the word kleo. And kleo means to sob violently. Remember on Sunday, we talked about when Peter denied Jesus, he sobbed violently. Same word, kleo. So picture Jesus just weeping and wailing loudly, sobbing over Jerusalem. Why? Because for the most part, they had rejected him. He's going to say in verse 42, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. 
For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, notice, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The NIV says, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's why he's weeping. He's weeping because they don't accept him to their own demise. They reject him to their own destruction. And so what Jesus predicts happens. In about the year 66 uh, yeah, 66 AD, uh, so now we're talking about 34 uh, years um, after Jesus prophesied this, um, the Jews will begin a war with the Romans. There's a Jewish-Roman war that goes from 66 A.D. until 73 A.D. The final thing that ends it in 73 A.D. is a stronghold where some Jews have gone up to uh, Masada, and they've hidden out of Masada, and that's the last stronghold, and the Romans finally besiege Masada, although it's a very tragic ending, what happens on the top of Masada, that's for another day. But 66 A.D. till 73 A.D., the Jews begin this war with the Romans rebelling against them, wanting to cast them off as the oppressor. And in 70 AD, uh, it culminates with the destruction of the temple, just what Jesus predicted here. Titus Vespasian, the emperor, comes in with Roman soldiers. They completely destroy the temple mount. And so Jesus predicts it here. Josephus, first century Jewish Roman historian, he was a Jew. He was hired by the Roman government to write history. Josephus was an eyewitness of the siege in 70 AD, and he would write uh, in his works that over the course of this war between the Jews and the Romans, that 1.1 million Jews will be killed, and 97,000 will be enslaved. So this is a very devastating thing that happens, and it, it happens just as Jesus predicted here. They did not recognize the time of God's coming to them. You know, there are so many people who sadly today don't recognize when God's knocking on their door. God's trying to get your attention. You might even be here tonight or watching online. God tries to get our attention in various ways. And it is tragic to ourselves when we don't recognize the time of God's coming. We invite hardship in our own lives when we don't recognize the time of God's coming. So this is not unique to them. This could be for any of us where Jesus is trying to get our attention, trying to reveal himself to us, trying to help us to understand who he is for our benefit. And yet we still reject him, we deny him, or we all together just don't even acknowledge him at all. You know, it's interesting because they are indicted by Jesus here because their own scriptures predicted when he would come. You don't need to turn there, but I, I want to reference Daniel chapter 9, because when Jesus says you did not recognize the time of God's coming to them, they should have known it because Daniel makes a prophecy that spells it out. And it's interesting, it wasn't until the 20th century, a guy by the name of uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who lived 1841 to 1918. He was uh, chief of Scotland Yards. He was knighted by Queen Victoria. He was um, educated. He had an LLD, which is the equivalent of a Doctor of Law degree today, at Trinity College in Dublin. And in 1895, he wrote a book called The Coming Prince. Now, it's the coming prince out of Daniel chapter 9, which actually is talking about the Antichrist. So he wrote this book about the Antichrist. But what he did, interestingly, was he mathematically took what Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 and actually came up with a date of when Jesus would arrive in Jerusalem. Because what he did was he took, and I'll read to you from Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, where Daniel said, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the prince comes, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. 
And what Daniel was referring to was the actual coming of Messiah into Jerusalem. And he dates it from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When did that happen? In Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah tells us that that issue, that order, that decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was issued by King Artaxerxes on March the 14th, 445 B.C. So we know specifically when the decree was issued. March the 14th, 445 B.C. And Daniel says there shall be a combination of seven, literally seven sevens, and 62 sevens, for a total of 69 sevens, meaning seven-year periods. Even though the word weeks is used in the English, it can mean seven sevens. So what, so what Sir um, Robert Anderson did was he took 69, multiplied it by seven years, and you come out with 483 years. And then you multiply that by the number of days And he even took the Babylonian calendar back in the day when Daniel issued this prophecy, which has 360 days in the year, not 365, like ours. And he multiplied the years by the number of days and came up with 173,880 days. And when you add that to March the 14th, 445 BC, when the issue of the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes, it comes to April the 6th, 32 AD. And so even as Daniel prophesied, this is when Messiah will come, had they looked carefully at their scriptures, they would have realized, ah, you know, King Artaxerxes, Nehemiah chapter 2, he gave that decree. It's about time to be fulfilled. But they missed it completely. Their own stubborn refusal to believe in who Christ was and is led to their own destruction. Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. May it not be said of us. May we know and recognize the time of God's coming to us, the way that he speaks to us, the way that he is drawing us close to himself, the way that he is trying to get our attention about things. May we never miss the time of God's coming to us. We're going to sing now. And Steph is going to come and lead us in a song. Let's just worship the Lord here. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes I see His love and mercy Washing over all our sin The people sing The people sing Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna Hosanna Hosanna, Hosanna. 
and open up my eyes to the things I'm seeing. Show me how to love like you have loved me. And break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into Eternity Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna Hosanna Lord, we pray in the different ways you're speaking to us, we would not miss that. When you came ab um, among your own, your own received you not. Lord, we receive you, we accept you. And we pray that we would always incline our ear to that still small voice when you speak to us. At times when you would challenge us, at times when you would encourage us, at times when you would warn us or counsel us, may we always have an ear that hears what you are saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 7, we come now to the place of what we call the Lord's Supper, but it was really the Passover meal that they were sharing together. Luke 22, 7, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. In other words, the Passover lamb. And he, that's Jesus, sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. You know, I always just have to chuckle again. You know, I wonder how awkward his disciples always felt like, wait, you want us to steal a donkey? All right, now you just want us to invite ourselves into somebody's house and say, show us the room because that's where we're gonna eat dinner in your house? Yes, do that. And so that's what they do. It says that they went and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the Passover. Now, it was important for Jewish people to celebrate the Passover meal because it was a reminder to them that they had been delivered from over 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And they never wanted to forget that. And so God instituted the Passover as a feast and with the Passover came a meal that is called the Seder meal uh, to always commemorate their suffering and to remember God's mighty hand of deliverance 
when he miraculously took them out of Egypt through a series of, remember, 10 different plagues that Pharaoh was too stubborn to release the Jewish people, the people that he had enslaved for generations until God uh, showed him, you know, if you're not going to bend the knee, then I'll, I'll force you to bend the knee. And through a series of 10 different plagues, eventually Pharaoh said, go, please go. And then, of course, you know the story where he changed his mind. He wanted to get him back. Why? Well, there was free labor. I mean, the Hebrew slaves had built a lot of the major cities in Egypt for 400 years. And so Pharaoh was reluctant to let him go. And after he did, he wanted him back. And the Passover feast was a regular reminder that God had delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. So before we read further in Luke 22, I'm going to come back here to Luke 22, but I I want us to turn over to Exodus chapter 12 so that we can uh, see the uh, Passover and how it was instituted and how it really fits with the whole understanding of Jesus's sacrifice. When you look at the Jewish feast and the calendar of feasts, you know, everything that God did in terms of the feasts was to point a bigger picture to his ultimate plan. And Passover fits exactly with the whole sacrifice of Christ, as you're going to see here in a moment, for those of you who aren't familiar with this. And so in Exodus chapter 12, it says in verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this is the month of Abib, and it is now called Nisan, but originally this was to mark the beginning of their calendar year. Uh, The the, uh, Israeli people today have a civil calendar that begins in the month of Tishri, So they've kind of abandoned this, to be honest with you. But originally, God intended for Jewish life to be marked by a religious calendar that started in the month of Abib, or now today, uh, Abib is called Nisan, and it was to mark their year. And verse 2, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th of this month, so the 10th of Nisan, every man shall take for himself a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And a household, by the way, was defined by at least 10 people. One man would get one lamb for at least a household of 10. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be, notice, without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. And will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so you see his instruction here, God's instruction through Moses and Aaron um, was to communicate God's divine protection for his own people. And thus I will pass over these homes, and that's why it's named Passover, I will pass over these homes that are marked by the blood of the lamb. You put the blood of the lamb across the doorpost and the lintels, and I will see that home, and I will pass over and not bring death to it. Otherwise, God brought death to the firstborn of every man and every beast in the land of Egypt as this final way to get Pharaoh to release the Hebrew people and let them go back to their promised land. It sounds, you know, pretty harsh, but that's because there were nine plagues before that 
Pharaoh stubbornly refused to acknowledge, so God's going to pull out all the stops at the end here. Fine, you, you don't believe that I'm God, you, you're reluctant to let my people go, then you're going to experience widespread death across the land. But the homes of the Jewish people, of the Hebrew people, that were marked by the blood of the Lamb, God would pass over. In Hebrew, it's Pesach, Pesach. In Greek, it's Pascha. And we get Paschal, the Paschal lamb, we talk about, that's from the Greek word. But Pascha and Pesach mean Passover. And so God implemented this gracious provision for the people whose lives, whose homes were marked by the blood, that no death should come to those homes. And he's very, God is very meticulous here in chapter 12 of Exodus to lay out, here's how the feast is supposed to work. Here's how you're to select a lamb. I mean, he's very specific. He even says on a particular date, the 10th of Nisan, right there in verse uh, 3. The 10th of Nisan is when the lamb out of the flock is to be selected. And not just any lamb. The lamb has to be a year old, and it has to have no blemish, no defect. All of this, of course, is pointing to Christ. Because there's going to be a lamb that is taken from among the flock. It, it can have no defect. It can have uh, no blemish. It was to be taken in the prime of its life. And it was to be a sacrifice. The blood of which would mark your home so that no death would come to you. Do you see it all? It's this beautiful picture of Christ portrayed to us in the Old Testament through Pesach, through Passover, through the Passover lamb. And so this is, this is what he um, requires of the Jewish people. Now, it's interesting in, in even some of this specific terminology. The 10th of Nisan was the day that the lamb was supposed to be presented, selected. And it was to be observed until, notice in verse 6, the 14th day. So from the 10th, it was to be selected, observed, and then watched until the 14th day to make sure no blemish, defect, or infection happened. And then on the 14th, it was to be slaughtered. So God was very specific about this. Now check this out. So we know that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a Sunday. It was the first day of the week. So when you line up how Christ came consistent with the Passover feast on the Jewish calendar, he would have entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. Remember, he is the lamb. Paul would even write in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he is our Passover lamb. John the Baptist, when he would see Jesus for the first time, coming towards him to be baptized, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist would say, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on not just some irrelevant date, but on the 10th of Nisan, consistent with Jewish scripture about the presentation of the Passover lamb. And he would be observed he would be in the temple courts. He would teach. The people would question him. The Pharisees would, you know, challenge him. Until the 14th of Nisan, when Jesus would be crucified. Now, this is not a hill I'm going to die on, but I've consistently said this over the years, that I believe when you look at the Jewish calendar and the consistency of Jesus paralleling the Passover meal, the Passover lamb himself, he was presented on the 10th of Nisan, which is a Sunday. He would have been crucified on the 14th of Nisan, consistent with Jewish scripture, which was a Thursday, not a Friday. I know we say Good Friday, but I think it's Good Thursday. All right. It's interesting, though, why, why is it that Jesus, if, if he died on a third, you know, if you've ever tried to do the, you know, the chronology, how do you, how is he three days if, if he dies on a Friday and then is raised on a Sunday? It's interesting. Listen to this in John 19. You don't need to turn. But in John 19, 30 to 31, it tells us that when Jesus had received the drink at, at the time of his crucifixion, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was, this is John 19, verse, 30, verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation, which is the 14th of Nisan. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath, the 15th of Nisan. Because the Jews did not want bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. In the Bible, 
It tells us that Passover begins on the 14th of Nisan with a Passover meal. The lamb is slaughtered. On the 15th of Nisan, it begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread for a total of an eight-day feast. But the 15th of Nisan is considered in the Bible, it tells us, a special Sabbath. So guess what? In the year that Christ was crucified, if He dies on a Thursday, the next day is the 15th of Nisan, which is a consecrated holy day. It is like a Sabbath. John 19, 30 says it was a special Sabbath, which means in that year you have two Sabbaths back to back. The regular Jewish Sabbath, which is Saturday, and the 15th of Nisan before it, which was a Friday. And thus it makes more sense when you think about Jesus died on a Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, He rises from the dead. But again, it's one of those things where it doesn't, you don't want to need to split hairs over it. I mean, the fact of the matter is, as long as you believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again, that's all that really matters. But in Exodus chapter 12, when, when God goes through this whole thing, it just fits with Jesus. Even the fact that the lamb was to be selected in the first year, Jesus died in the prime of his life. It says that you were to slaughter the lamb in verse 6, at twilight. At twilight in Hebrew literally is translated between the two evenings. That is between 3 and 5 p.m. The Bible says that when Christ was crucified, that darkness came over the land from 12 noon until 3 p.m., and at 3 p.m. is when he said, it is finished. That's when he literally died, exactly consistent with the sacrifice of the Passover lambs that were happening at the same time, at the same hour, on the Temple Mount. So, as just a quick pass through, the lamb was selected and inspected on the 10th of Nisan. Here's how it corresponds. Jesus was selected, inspected on the 10th of Nisan, Palm Sunday, when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Number two. The lamb sacrificed was to be a year old male. That's what we just read. Jesus died in the prime of his life. Number three, the lamb was to be without blemish. We just read that. Well, Jesus was a perfect sacrifice, a lamb without blemish or defect, 1 Peter 1.19. Number four, the lamb was sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan at twilight, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., and Jesus would have been crucified on the 14th Nisan, and he died at the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock p.m., Number five, the bread, matzah of Passover, was without yeast. That's Exodus 12, 8. Jesus was the bread of life without sin. John 6, 8, 48, and Hebrews 4, 15. Number six, the lamb was to be sacrificed without breaking a bone. Exodus 12, 46, Jesus was crucified and not a bone was broken. John 19, 36, Psalm 34, 20. And last point. The blood of the lamb was God's gracious provision to save the Jews in Egypt, but it pointed to the blood of Jesus, which was God's gracious provision to save all people in the world. Amen? He is the lamb that died for the sins of the world. Amen. Let's sing. See him there, the great I am. A crown of thorns upon his head The Father's heart displayed for us Oh God, we thank you for the cross And lift it up on Calvary's hill we cursed your name, and even still you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story.
offered up this sacrifice for every sin our Savior died the Lord of life oh he can't be contained cause our God has risen from the grave sacrifice thank you for your sacrifice Lord we worship you we remember you we celebrate you we glorify you we magnify you you are worthy of our praise you are the lamb who laid down your life for the sins of the world you shed your blood to redeem us from our sins. And your blood that marks our lives means that you pass over us so that we don't have to experience death, but we might be saved and have eternal life. Though our body of flesh will decay, our spirit can go to be with you forever and we will receive a glorified body because you died for the sins of the world. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Still in Luke chapter 22. It says in verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread 
and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table and truly the son of man goes it is as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. And so Jesus has this Passover meal with his disciples and he gives brand new meaning to it. And he helps them to understand that for the last about 1400 years, the Jewish people had been celebrating the Passover to commemorate the past, what God had done by delivering them from their slavery in Egypt. And Jesus is basically helping them to understand, and us now too, listen, the Passover, yes, commemorates that event, but that was just a picture of a greater deliverance, the greater deliverance that my blood would provide for you for your sins, that you are enslaved to sin, you are in bondage to sin, just like the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt, and God sent a deliverer whose name was Moses. But Jesus is the greater deliverer who would deliver us from the slavery of sin and death. And so he says, now the Passover meal is not just to look back, but from where he delivers this message to look forward. For us, it's looking back at the cross, but he's letting his disciples know my sacrifice on the cross is really what Passover is all about. Because if you by faith believe in what I did for you on the cross, then I shall pass over you. Death won't come to you, but eternal life through faith in me. And so he takes the bread and he takes the cup. Now it's interesting. When he takes the bread here in verse uh, 15, uh, 19, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. This is typically what we say when we have communion. The bread at a Passover meal is called the afikomen. It's interesting because afikomen is a Greek word that is inserted into a Hebrew seder. Afikomen translates that which is to come. He takes this as the dessert afikomen. That's when it was offered, after they ate. And in fact, in Matthew 26, 26, it says that Jesus broke the bread while they were still eating. So we know that this is the dessert matzah. This is the afikomen. And afikomen, there were three pieces of matzah at a typical Passover Seder. And the afikomen was the matzah was in the middle between the other two pieces of matzah. If you ask a Jew today, why do you have three pieces of matzah at your Passover meal? They will say, tradition says, that the three pieces of matzah point to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's interesting that every time they take the afikomen at that point in the meal, they take the middle one. It isn't a representation of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In reality, it's a representation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when that middle matzah is taken, the afikomen, which translates itself, that which is to come, it is a celebration of the Messiah who came and is coming again. He is our deliverer. Go with me for the last section now into Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Jesus will be arrested. He will be handed over to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor at the time. And in Matthew 27, verse 22, Pilate said to them, the Jewish people, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. And then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You know, uh, Pontius Pilate was in a predicament here. Um, the Jewish people were like a mob at this point. And he wanted to satisfy them, but he also wanted to satisfy Caesar. And history tells us that Pontius Pilate had been warned on numerous occasions that he was too bloodthirsty. 
and he was going to be recalled from his post if he didn't stop butchering people. And so he knows this, and he thinks, if I have this guy crucified, I'm likely to be recalled. Do you know the history says that after Jesus was crucified, shortly thereafter, Pontius Pilate was recalled to Gaul, where he committed suicide. I mean, he, it's like he lived with the guilt of this decision. But he tries to wash his hands of this whole thing, but at the same time, he wants to appease the people. Uh, Warren Wearsby said that Judas yielded to Satan. Peter yielded to his flesh, and Pontius Pilate yielded to the world. And he has Jesus scourged. I mean, the process that the Romans went to in executing someone, crucifying someone, was unmatched by any other civilization. The Persians actually, if you've got to use the term, invented crucifixion, but the Romans perfected it. In 1986, in the Journal of American Medical Association, Dr. W.D. Edwards wrote an article called The Physical Death of Jesus Christ. If you want to Google it, go home. And it's, it's a fascinating but horrific read, really. When he goes into great detail about the process that Jesus would have gone through to endure the suffering that he did. In 1986, JAMA, Dr. W.D. Edwards, The Physical Death of Jesus Christ. He is scourged and then he is sent to be crucified. And verse 27 says, And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now, he's already been severely flogged here. The Romans would, beat, would, would uh, whip someone 40 times minus one. They'd give 39 lashes because it, it like, appeased their conscience to think, well, we could have given him 40 under our law, but we're only give 39. So they would do 40 minus one as some kind of act of mercy. But in the process of whipping someone, the a cat of nine tails, uh, the, the flagellum in Latin, the Roman whip was leather straps, and at the end of leather straps were barbs of bone and glass, so that when the one who would whip someone, would, it, they would twist their wrist, and every time they would whip someone's back, they would also be pulling out flesh. I mean, someone's back would just be ribbons of flesh, and most Criminals, not that Jesus was a criminal, but he was being treated like one. Most criminals died at the whipping post before they even made it to a cross. Isaiah chapter 52, in prophesying about the Messiah, says that Jesus was beaten so badly in the process of all the abuse that he took here that he was not recognizable. Verse 32. And now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, that's a city in, in Libya, North Africa, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. I'm going to put up on the screen for you a picture of Golgotha. Uh, Golgotha is an Aramaic word that means skull, place of the skull. You can see it in the outcropping. This is actually in, in Jerusalem. This is believed to be, because it fits the description, the place where either Jesus was crucified above on top of this rocky outcropping or below in front of it. But I'll circle, kind of draw in the skull there so you can kind of see the face in the outcropping. And so it was called the place of the skull. Again, that's Aramaic. Uh, in Greek, it is called uh, cranion. We get our English word cranium from that word. And in Latin, it is called calvarium. And calvarium is where we get the English word cal calvary. So whenever we talk about calvary and we sing about calvary, it's talking about the place of the skull. It's talking about Golgotha. Now notice he was given wine mingled with gall to drink but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. This was an analgesic. And it's fascinating for us to think 
that this was considered, you know, something that it would give criminals as they were being crucified to help lessen the pain. And Jesus refused it. Why? Because he didn't think about this. He didn't want anything to dull the pain that he took for you and me. And then they crucified him. Verse 35. And divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come now down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Although, by the way, the gospel of Luke tells us that one of them eventually did turn and acknowledge Jesus as Christ. And it says in verse 45, now from the sixth hour, that's 12 noon, until the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I want you to notice with me when Jesus says there in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, and it's translated for us, he's quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1. It again is a messianic passage. And notice he refers to God as my God, not my Father. He's quoting Psalm 22, 1, Eli, Eli, he's quoting my God, my God, not my Father. Why? Because he is identifying in that moment with you and me. And he's crying out as the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins to God for the salvation of all who would believe. And he's crucified for our sins. Surely this is the Son of God. Well, the grave didn't keep him. And he rose again in three days. And that's what we will celebrate this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. But first, we're going to close with a song of celebration as we wrap up tonight's Bible study. Can we all stand together? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you paid the price for our sins. You gave your life on a cross. You shed your blood as the Passover lamb that takes away the sins of the world. You were sacrificed as a parallel to the Passover because you are our Passover lamb. You have delivered us from the slavery of sin and death. And you have given unto us, for as many as would believe and receive, the free gift of salvation. Thank you for what you endured, the suffering, the shame, the pain, the beatings, being nailed to a cross, and you did it all because of your love for us. And as we gather again this weekend to celebrate your resurrection, we pray that tonight as we close in song, we would be mindful of all that you went through, of your great sacrifice for us, the depth of your love for us that you would do such a thing to redeem us from our sins. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's sing. There is a song, I know it well, a melody that's never failed. On mountains high, in valleys low, my soul will rest, my confidence.
confidence is you alone. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set this sinner free. Hope has a name. Help me.